We just finished playing some D&D and I want to tell you about it. So last time we left off our three heroes, Gimbal, the gnome wizard, Tusk, the dwarf druid, and Tobin, the tabaxi ranger, had ventured into the Aurelian woods to find some of this rare lichen to help create more antidotes for this assassin who's been running around the city, poisoning the leaders of the factions that are in charge of stuff like the magic and the trade and the law enforcement in Port Vela. They also found Gimbal's co-worker, I guess you would call him, and sort of rescued him from the forest and are heading back into town when they are stopped by an old druid who they recognize from the very first part of the very first session when they were hanging out in the Boar and the Babe Tavern. So this druid, her name is Several Mirowin, she approaches the group, cautiously questions them to sort of figure out where their motivations lie. She sort of gets an idea of how they feel about all the forest being chopped down. The group is definitely not psyched about that, so she warns them of this war that is about to happen. Total Tolkien-style war where the treants, the keepers of the forest of this Aurelian wood, are fed up with their home being chopped down. If it goes on much longer, they're going to attack the city. So she warns them of that and gives them a little bit more information. The new leader of the Merchant Guild is building up a fleet of ships. They're using the trees from this forest to do that. And basically the group is the people she's going to to ask for help because she saw them jump into action at the boar and the babe when the uh, shadow dogs attacked. So they agree to help. They go back to the city and actually they the group splits up, which usually is not a good idea. <laughs> So Gimbal, he and Farden, uh, his co-worker that they sort of rescued, they go back to the Crafty Cauldron where they work and they talk with Marigold, who is the owner of the Crafty Cauldron, the apothecary that they both work at. They deliver some more of this lichen for antidote and she pays them a lot of money, tells them that the money is coming from the new friends that they save, the leader of the bounty, which is the Farmers and Fishers Guild. See campaign diary number one for that whole story. Some conversation happened and basically while Gimbal was away for two weeks, Marigold hired a replacement but she is offering Gimbal this new job of collecting rare materials for more higher end potions and alchemy type things. She is trying to sort of shore up her business because the Plexus, the same people that are cutting down uh, this forest, have also tried to strong arm her into joining their network of merchants. She's not having it, so her idea is to expand her operation a little bit, make sure that this Plexus guild can't come in and, you know, take up her supply of, of ingredients and, and all that stuff. So while Gimbal is there doing that, Tosk goes back to the boar and the babe to check in with Lion, the bartender. Lion lets Tosk know that Yara, the bard that's been staying with them, has gone away and isn't there tonight, so the the tavern is kind of slow. So Tosk uses his good berry spell to make like 10 berries that feed you for a day and he goes out and finds people that need food and gives them his good berries. <laughs> and while that is going on, Tobin, our intrepid tabaxi ranger, he goes on patrol through the city kind of looking for this goblin assassin. So Port Vela is split into a bunch of different parts but the main the main division is the outside the wall part and then the inside the wall part. He's up on the wall and he's avoiding the hand, which is the city's thieves guild. They wear navy cloaks. They're allowed to steal from people, but they're also like the, the city guard. So they they're, they basically like regulate the crime in the city. He's avoiding the people that are on lookout on top of the wall, but he looks down and notices somebody wearing one of these navy cloaks steal from a person who's like carrying groceries home and he goes after them. It is a 
young half-elf who has the navy cloak and dirty boots and sort of messy hair. He's sort of stealthing behind them and, you know, just, just watching to see what they do. And he, he sees them break into a bakery, goes around back and tries to kind of break into the back of the shop. The story of this session is Tobin either rolling crazy high or rolling ones. So he rolled like a 26 lock picking or something. So I said like the door just opens. He like doesn't even touch it. But then he rolled a one for his stealth. So uh, he walks in and this member of the hand is standing right in front of him. They're holding their short sword at their at their side and he doesn't know what to do. He wasn't, the whole time he's not sure if he should even be doing this because he knows that the hand, they're allowed to steal from people, but he thinks that's wrong, so he follows them, but he knows the hand isn't necessarily allowed to break into a bakery, like that's not allowed, so uh, he follows follows them in, and they have this confrontation where they end up saying, look, we're, we're both not supposed to be here, so why don't we just walk away and nothing has to happen? And as they say that, Tobin notices that they left this pouch of gold that they stole on the countertop. You know, they have their, their short sword in one hand and a piece of, uh, you know, like a loaf of bread in the other. And they're slowly backing up, about to leave the bakery. He can't make up his mind. He can't make up his mind what to do. He knows this is wrong, but he doesn't, he's not sure he wants to get into a fight. And so this member of the hand throws <laughs> <laughs> throws the bread at him and jumps over the counter and out into the street and I rolled a natural 20 so the bread <laughs> hits him right in the eye and does a point of damage and he sort of stumbles for a second and then runs after them and he grabs the, the pouch of gold off of the counter and runs after them but as soon as they're out into the street this uh, member of the hand is like casually walking. They're not running away. They turn around and see Tobin coming after them. And they say like, why are you following me? Tobin says, you took something that didn't belong to you. And the member of the hand says, I don't know what you're talking about. And Tobin holds up the coin purse. The hand member whistles super loud and says, Thief starts running after Tobin to arrest him. Tobin has tabaxi reflexes, so he like darts off, jumps up a building where the, the member of the hand can't follow him. He's, he's running away, trying to get out of sight. The first roll he makes was like 20 something, so he like bounds over these buildings. And then the second roll he makes was another one. So he stumbles and falls right into to another member of the hand but luckily he's able to like push them down and run away and escape but he still has this coin pouch that he's looking to return to this person this random person on the street now I guess in theory the hand the police are gonna be on the lookout for Tobin. So after that craziness, everyone meets up, the party returns together how they should be, and they meet back up at the Boar and the Babe where they rest for the night. Tobin and Tosk have a very restful night's sleep, but Gimbal has this dream where he's walking through a cave, like giant bioluminescent mushrooms. He's sort of being pulled through this cave until he sees a fully cloaked shadowy figure sitting on a, a chair behind a purple swirling like campfire. They have yellow, like bright yellow eyes staring at them through this hood and their furred hands are gripping this chair that they're sitting in. But the weird thing is that the, the thumbs of this hand are on the opposite side. So some, this weird creature, uh, if, if you're super into D&D, you might know what kind of creature this is. This raspy, kind of coughing, hacking voice taunts Gimbal and says, I see you've, you've met new friends and I can't wait to devour their flesh. My friend Scott, who plays Gimbal, like did this awesome, like, like kind of hit, hit the dude right back with like, Oh, whatever, you've been trapped in here for how long now? Like, so Gimbal and this creature kind of had this back and forth. He could tell that it was still weak, but it was taunting him and saying, you shouldn't underestimate me. I can't wait to see you again, but you won't see me. All this sort of 
nasty stuff and then the dream ends. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how how Gimbal thought of it. This was the, the first time he's been visited by this creature from his past in his dream. I don't think Gimbal is quite sure what to make of this interaction, but it is hopefully a little scary, a little don't forget this thing from your past is here and it's coming for you. Okay, so the next morning they run around town, they go back to the University of Eight, see the previous episode for that whole thing, and then they go visit Kwame, the leader of the Bounty, which is the Farmers and Fishers Guild. Basically the Bounty, any leftover, like excess stuff that the farmers and the fishers have, they take it and they ship it all over and, you know, make the farmers more money. And then obviously they keep a lot of money for themselves. And so they have this big operation of, it's like this giant castle with a courtyard where they store everything. And in the center of that is offices and home of the leaders of this guild. Kwame being the, the main leader, she invites them in. There's like all these tropical plants and like weird architecture. And they ask her like, is there anything that she can do to help with the deforestation that's happening. She doesn't have anything she can help with at the moment, but she does say that she suspects the new leader of the Plexus to be up to something. There's nothing that she can do to sort of move against them at the moment, but if this, if the group could start proving things were fishy, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> maybe they could do something to, to stop the Plexus from expanding so quickly. So Kwame thinks that one of the Plexus's trade ships, the Stalwart Whale, is actually responsible for the disappearance of one of her ships that was uh, traveling north to deliver a, a shipment of food and fish. They haven't heard from the ship, but the Stalwart Whale, one of the, the biggest Plexus ships, left Port Vela at the same time uh, traveled north and and arrived when the bounty ship should have, but they haven't. It's disappeared. They don't know what happened to it. So um, she's asking the group to investigate the stalwart whale and see if they can find out any information about the missing bounty ship. So the group heads into town. They, they go through the north gate and travel down onto the docks, which is like this huge sprawling docks. It's like the city continues out over the harbor of Port Vela that was created by this meteor strike. And um, they pass a giant building that has a huge painted sign that says Bright Star Ale. And there's uh, buckets of water being pulled up by this sort of complex pulley system up into the building. They stop at the biggest building on the docks has this huge curved roof and glass all the way around it and it, it's called the imminent prow and this is where the plexus are making all of their new ships so they're making like a couple of ships a day and so wood is being brought in and it's like assembly line of these giant trade ships being built and dumped into the harbor like one after another but before they could investigate it any further they hear a commotion further down the dock they quickly run over to see what's going on and there is a young man wearing a white robe with a gold star on it which is one of the order of valorum clerics another one of these big factions in the city is arguing with a ship cap they look up and they see that stone giant is chained and secured, bound up and tied to the mast of this ship. And this cleric and the captain are arguing, the cleric saying, what is this? This is slavery. You have no right to chain up this giant. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's for the safety of my crew and the passengers aboard the ship. Uh, and they, they sort of realize that the ship has brought people to come work in the mines, which is a big part of the Plexus, the, the Merchants Guild's operations. This cleric is really upset that they have this giant chained up. And they're arguing, they're arguing. A group of sailors start unloading the giant. They all have these, these chains kind of securing it and they're pulling it off the ship. So the party is watching this argument get more and more heated. So Gimbal casts Comprehend Languages and shouts over to the giant that's being pulled off the ship. 
and says, Nod if you were brought here against your will. And the giant looks at Gimbal and then looks at the captain and doesn't nod. The sailors are sort of like pulling on the chains of this giant, leading it off the ship and down the dock. And then Tobin, <laughs> Tobin, hates what he's seeing here. The cleric and the captain are arguing more and more. This this giant is in chains and Tobin just pushes the captain. Of course, he rolled a 20, so the captain flies back into the side of the ship and down into the water. And at that, the giant breaks out of his manacles, grabs the chains that the, the sailors are kind of pulling him with and flings them around, knocking these these sailors about, and then just starts hauling butt down the dock towards the cleric and our party of heroes. And that's where we ended the session. The players learned a whole bunch about the politics of Port Vela, and now they have this stone giant barreling down the dock towards them, unsure if it is a friend or a foe. So in a couple of weeks, we're gonna play again and find out what happens next. Thanks for watching.